My name is Joseph Wunderlich, I'm Professor of Engineering, Architecture, and Computer Science. Today is a quick review of some neural network um, software code. And uh, behind me, above me, I'm going to talk about in a second here. I'm going to change the background to that. Um, this is an introductory course. I teach advanced courses on the material that we'll cover today. So this is just an introduction here. Okay. All right, this is a neural network chip behind me that I made in 1992. I also have a paper design uh, of a different kind of neural network chip I did in 1990-91, filed a patent disclosure document in the US Patent Office for it. There are two different kinds of chips. This one's a spiking neuron that uh, mimics the uh, output uh, transient voltage response of a neuron, biological neuron firing. And um, it's actually a hybrid of uh, analog and digital circuits, capacitors, and orange, and a lot of digital circuitry in the middle. This is 10,000 transistors, Moses tiny chip uh, did, did in VSI design, um, where we used uh, Berkeley magic to draw all the circuits at the transistor level, including the gates widths and all the wire widths and then ported that into a version of uh, P-SPICE for analog circuit analysis, and then uh, uh, wrapped around it on top of it with a logic simulator once it was uh, working. But everything is designed here um, by hand, including the clock generators and the drivers to drive the capacitive loads on the wires, all the wire routing. A lot of that's done automatically now, especially if you do hardware descriptive language, uh, you're lucky to have any idea what the circuits are doing. But when you're actually designing circuits at the circuit level as a computer engineer, you need to uh, know how to do this at the very low level. Uh, and so I have two neural network chips and, and the uh, code you're going to see that I'm going to run in a second is um, simulation code. Uh, uh, well, the precursor to the simulation code that I ran to show that I could tweak the gradient descent neural network learning for back propagation uh, in the pursuit of doing an all digital uh, neural network chip. And that was very difficult to do anything like that long ago. Um, and if you know anything about neural network learning, gradient descent learning, you need a continuously differentiable transfer function, the sigmoid, and then uh, you use multivariable chain rule, you know, calc three uh, to, uh, to derive uh, the learning algorithm. And then so I had to drill down into that math and tweak it and do numerical methods and simulate that, prove that it worked for the learning and the simulation and then implement it in hardware. My name is Professor Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. And this is a lecture, uh, introductory, introductory lecture on machine intelligence. Um, and so we want to begin with uh, symbolic AI versus neural networks. Now, now, some of the naming has been changed here at Deep Learning, and that's referring to uh, neural networks. Uh, traditional symbolic AI, uh, it still exists in many ways, in many places, uh, but it's more of the uh, historic beginning of things. So symbolic AI, uh, what that is, is uh, uses special forms of programming uh, and establishes rules that leads to uh, certain outcomes in an efficient way. So it's uh, pruning the search space, it's implementing heuristics, has inference. Um, it's code and it's, it's, it's set uh, a set of rules that they're subject to uh, usually the programmer's uh, ideas or an expert uh, that they consult for an expert system. Um, I have a whole history that you can learn on about that in uh, other courses you can find online, uh, some of my historical discussions of things. Now, neural networks are different. Um, they use a collection of neurons uh, in, in layers now to collectively uh, generalize um, solutions. You give them a training set and um, a set of uh, criteria, uh, or a set of uh, stimulus and desired outputs, and then it learns them. And, and they may be conflicting you know, within the set, there may be you know, conflicting things, 
where you know one set of stimuli wants one result, another set wants something completely different, and then the weights, the interconnection weights that magnify the signals through uh, between the neurons, uh, those weights are changed incrementally uh, to settle on some solution to satisfy multiple multiple constraints simultaneously. So let's start off with here an example. Suppose you have two parents deciding between getting a puppy or a kitten for their baby to play with. Uh, so we assign a binary variable variable to this decision, a zero for a puppy and a one for a kitten. So we'll just start out with uh, a non-machine intelligence case where uh, the parents agree that if either one of them really wants a certain kitten, uh, the spouse will yield to that desire. This would like uh, be like uh, an OR gate, where the parents assign the variables x and y would decide an outcome of one for a kitten. So mom and dad looks like this. So um, you know, if either one of them wants a kitten, or both, then they get a kitten. Uh, otherwise, you get a puppy. And the decision process without pruning the search space would look something like this: uh, x y equals zero zero. Then get a yeah, decision equals this. And so you understand that from any programming you've had uh, of those cases. Now the symbolic AI case is where the parents uh, would have some degree of confidence in their choice. So there's one way to do it. Uh, artificial intelligence, expert systems, you put uh, confidence values. It's like probability theory, but it's a little different. So confidence is different than probability. Uh, and you can read about that in my machine intelligence lectures. But uh, so what you have here is a confidence that uh, if if uh, you know they're only twenty percent sure uh, each about and they both agree you know then uh, um, uh, you, you get this kind of uh, variable input and then you know then you're getting a puppy with a certain degree of confidence you have to calculate. And I have a link there that you can follow that uh, will, uh, in the PDF version of this, or, or the PowerPoint PPTX version, if you're watching it on YouTube or the MP4, um, well, you have to type it in, I guess, if you're just watching the MP4 on YouTube, I'll try to put a comment to the PDF of this file so you have a clickable link. Um, so now let's look at neural network case. So um, using the same thoughts of the parents as in the non-machine intelligence case, you have um, mom and dad and uh, X and Y, and, and there's no, uh, no confidence here. We're just starting off with the first case where you have binary uh, decisions on the parents' part, and so the output's a binary decision also. And we're going to train now a neural network to uh, do this. So here is a 2 to one neural network. That means two inputs, two hidden layer neurons, and an output. Uh, there's also biases on here. You typically just set the bias coming in as a one signal. But the weights will change. And the weights, uh, these weights, you, you initialize them. They can be randomized. There is actually ways, there's mathematical theories to how to initialize the weights to be uh, based on the problem to learn more quickly. So uh, in essence, what we want to do is we want to um, have this machine, this network, learn this decision process, learn to uh, satisfy all these constraints, exemplars one, two, three, and four simultaneously. So all the weights need to be changed such that all of those are satisfied simultaneously. Now, initially they won't. And so each time all four of those are presented to the network, that's called one epoch. You see that on the X value of the graph, one epoch. And that, so uh, the way this works, initial, uh, the learning process works. You see steps down here. You initialize the inner neuron connection weights to randomize values, or you can do it in a deterministic way, but typically just randomize them. Feed, feed the neural net, number two, feed the neural network one exemplar at a time, each time using the error between desired output and actual output to change connection weights between the neurons. So this is back propagation, the standard 
back propagation, you take this error signal that's coming out. Uh, when you give it, give it an exemplar, feed it an exemplar, you have an output that comes out, an actual output. You compare that to the desired output. You make an error signal, the difference between the, you know, the two, desired and uh, actual. And then you take that error signal and you back propagate it. So then you'll change the weights between the hidden layer and the uh, output layer. And then you uh, propagate the error signal back through those weights into the first layer, first uh, connection matrix of weights between the hidden layer and the input layer. And so you change them all by a little bit. Uh, depending on the learning rate, you want to take tiny little bitty steps, uh, or otherwise your gradient descent learning won't work. You'll jump back and forth over the crack in the error surface uh, that leads to your minimum that you're looking for in your optimization in your gradient descent learning. That's uh, you, know, you need Calc 3 and multiple multivariable chain rule. Typically, you can learn that Calc 2 too, but multivariable chain rule, not just chain rule, but multivariable chain rule and partial derivatives uh, and and some, some mathematics, but we're not going to do that here. This is just introduction. So, um, so well, steps three here, repeat uh, this getting, feeding the exemplars and, and changing the connection weights for all four examples. Uh, so repeat number two until the output error is within reasonable proximity. Um, uh, so you do this one, you know, one neuron, at, uh, one exemplar at a time, and then that's an epic, and then you do it epic over epic over epic. You just repeat uh, this is actually, a, I probably should put a step in between two and three here. So you do, you know, all the, all of two over and over and over and over again. Um, um, and, and, and I guess it says that in three, until you reach some kind of, uh, some kind of tolerance. So you're trying to get binary outputs out of this thing, but it's, you can see it's not binary. It's actually analog values coming out of the thing. So you're, you know, somewhere between zero and one, and you want to accept as an output value, you accept something less than 0.1 as being zero, and something more than 0.9 as being a one. If your stopping tolerance is set at 0.1, you can change the tolerance if you like. If you if you don't have any tolerance, these things are asymptotic, and it, you'll just waste a lot of time trying to drive it to some absolute, um, you know, zero or one. Uh, I mean, you may get there eventually, but. Uh, I wouldn't waste the time. So typically, you you, uh, you threshold it or you uh, uh, put a tolerance. So number four, after learning is done, the neural network will react instantly to not only binary outputs but variations of the input. So that's very important uh, statement number four here. First of all, you don't have to go through the learning process once you've trained the thing. You just feed it something, and it should respond exactly the way you like. It will for the exemplars. Um, and just one feed, you know, you don't know, no epics here. I guess you'd say it's one epic, but it's not even, but there's no learning. So it's just like half an epic, just a feed forward right through one. You feed it, and it's only one exemplar. So it's not even an epic. You just one exemplar at a time. It's a fraction, it's a very, very small percentage of the time. It just reacts immediately in real time. And these things are used for, you know, serious, uh, and you can imagine whenever you need to react critical situations in nanosecond. You have the neural network, you even bend and embedded in hardware with the weights fixed. Um, I think it's super fast. I mean, nanoseconds, but it's not nanoseconds and you could spend, initially I spend days sometimes waiting for the simulations to learn on the old machines. Now everything's super fast. You use CUDA cores on graphics processors and things you know, many orders of magnitude faster now. But still, it's still, relatively speaking, much faster on the feed forward than uh, once it's learned. And additionally, in that statement number four, uh, which is a very important thing, the network will react to things other than the training set. And I'll say that again. The network will react to things other than the way you've taught it. So if you feed it something that's not just binary, it's some fraction, um, then... Uh, you know, it'll still react in some kind of way. That's what we're going to see in a, in a minute here. And which, in a way that's probably, uh, you know, and more, most likely correct or, or what you, close to what you would want, what you would anticipate getting. Uh, so that's an important, a very important thing. That it, the you know, neural network can adapt, or, you know, it's just inherent in the way it behaves, is that it, 
it can guess what you mean if you give it something other than uh, the inputs that uh, that it was expecting from the training set. So you see a neural network case number two here using the same thoughts of the parents as in the symbolic AI case. So now we, we are feeding it something other than binary inputs and uh, it's still it's still learning. I mean, it's still giving us results like we would expect. So because, you know, the fuzziness, the uncertainty of the parents isn't so extreme. Now, if you up the, up, you know, you put in something that's uh, like 0.5 is in here, somewhere between zero and one. Well, that, uh, you know, that that or even higher, you're going to you're going to get some uh, you know, the indecisiveness of the input. I mean, the thing can't learn if, if you have no idea what you want, and uh, you know, then the thing's not going to tell you um, anything. But it's it can adapt to the uh, the fuzziness, if you will, of the of the data. So now, continuing this this same example, if instead of uh, you know case number two, instead of randomizing weights in the beginning, we use uh, the weights that we learned in uh, case number one with just binary inputs and outputs, no fuzziness in the inputs, we see that uh, and it learns much faster. Then uh, case number three is just as I think we mentioned, uh, if once it's learned, it will just re respond to an exemplar in almost instantaneously. Uh, case number four, the same thing, almost instantaneous response if you give it something that's not exactly the inputs, something a little fuzzier in just the feed forward suite. Um, it doesn't need to learn anymore, just responding. Now, case number five is an odd case where, uh, it's not really odd, I mean, this happens all the time, where the, the things that are, are being asked to be done, learned in the training set, and the exemplars are contradicting themselves a little bit, a little bit. So if, if for this a case of a picking a puppy, if for some reason the one parent wants a kitten, uh, or you know only one of them wants it, then the other one just is oppositional and says I don't want it, uh, and and if they both agree, then uh, they, that's not uh, they're not they're not going to uh, uh, get a kitten. So um, so I, I I might have misspoke here. If, if they both want to get if either one of them wants to get a kitten, they get a kitten. If they both want one, then they end up getting a puppy, which, um, so, you know, the logic's a little bit uh, messed up here, but there's, you know, it's, it's human behavior, so you don't want to try to uh, make it work out too much. Uh, and the neural network's actually pretty good at uh, reading into this, uh, the intent and trying to resolve something. So regardless here, you have this what's called an exclusive or, and it's counterintuitive because uh, you know, to even have such a thing, if you think about uh, the stimulus, if you if both are zero, we get a zero coming out. You know, if you just imagine these signals going in and, and a signal coming out, and then you have uh, a zero one. Well, you get you're giving a little bit of juice, right? A little bit of one, a little bit of you know, this, uh, some value number magnitude. So you're going to get some magnitude coming out. Uh, if the other variable, you know, if x is 1 and y is 0, then you get something coming out. But if you have both of them feeding in, you get a 0. Well, now that's not going to be easily solved with just a single neuron. That actually held up uh, research in neural networks for a bunch of years when some renowned uh, MIT um, researchers, Minsky and Pepret, uh, said you can't do these nonlinear separable problems with a single perceptron. So it took almost uh, 16 years before Rummerhart came up with backpropagation and layered layered networks to solve this type of problem. So anyway, here you can see now that in the graph it took longer to learn, uh, almost 1,400 epochs as compared to you know 200 to 600 ish in the other previous examples because this is a non-linearly non separable problem. Now this case number six is a little, a little bit more odd, where for some strange reason the parents only get a puppy if both of them plus the neighbor 
uh, all either agree to get a puppy or for some really odd reason all want a kitten. So, you know, stretching the logic here a little bit, although you can imagine the part where if the neighbor doesn't want a dog and the dog's barking, you could factor that in somehow. Uh, but, you know, overall the logic's a little weird, but just, you know, uh, allow it so we can get this problem defined. And, and in reality, there's all kinds of problems, real world problems that lead to this kind of data. So you have uh, now three variables, input variables, mom, dad, and the neighbor. And so you have two to the three equals eight exemplars when you have, you know, how many permutations of three binary variables you have. You have, you know, you have n number of variables. You have two to the n permutations. So you have eight different combinations. And, uh, and so this is the data you're looking at here. So it's like almost like a big giant exclusive war if you think about it, where the first one and the last ones are the ones contradicting the most, you know, the, the, the biggest contradictions between the number one and eight. Um, so, um, you know, how long does that take to learn? And so you see that uh, uh, up there and the, over a thousand epics for, for that to learn. Now I'd like you to take some time and read through this, uh, the steps of uh, the algorithm uh, development, so one through eight and then look at some code. So take your time to look at this. This was code I wrote in, uh, originally not in MATLAB in 1991 uh, to just uh, lead up to tweaking the neural transfer function to allow parallel processing in hardware to make single chip neural computer. That was my master's thesis. And then a uh, uh, second processor made a different, whole different kind of theory with uh, uh, more of a biological inspiration after that. So I've made two neural processor designs in 91 and 93. So take a look at this, uh, look through it. Uh, most of you know how to program, so just look through. Uh, you look at uh, this stopping tolerance, ask yourself how that works and the learning rate. That's something that you'll learn about. You can read other lectures. You don't want that too big or you're not going to, yeah, it's not going to learn. Um, and then you'll see the weights being uh, initialized and uh, ran just random values here. And then the main code. Uh, go down, take a look at it, and see if you can figure out how the these uh, incremental changes are being made to the weights. And then the output plotting here at the end with some metrics. And then the whole code section for the 331 bigger architecture. And that's all the same, except just scaled up a little bit. And so just look through that, make sure that all makes sense to you. Uh, and lastly, you know, this uh, larger scaled up one ending and outputting some metrics. So now some explanation of the above code, uh, a little more detail from the lecture on this. Uh, firstly, we don't want to worry about CPU time anymore. Uh, this is something we used to do 20, 30 years ago. But now because of the way uh, computing is distributed and there's multiple cores, levels of caches, uh, <clears throat> shared memory, you don't know exactly how long a particular machine instruction is going to execute. So you can't really uh, do this, uh, you know, use this kind of metric in a, in a useful way. If you want to see more on that, you can click on the syllabus to my advanced computer engineering class where we talk about those kind of things. It's a parallel processing class. Uh, and then we have a selection of whether it's which architecture, 221 or 32 or 331. Uh, so, you know, two inputs, two hidden, one output, or three input, three hidden, one output. Um, <clears throat> then um, uh, I just point out here next that it's a command line interpreter. Um, which uh, <clears throat> I already mentioned. And then the learning rate. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, you have to uh, look at my more advanced lectures and uh, talk about that. But in general, uh, you don't want it too large, especially for nonlinearly uh, separable problems where uh, the weights need to slowly change. Uh, if you have too big of a learning rate, you will uh, miss uh, the local minima 
know, jumping back and forth on the error surface over a trench that could lead to one. Um, and then we have an uh, epic count of 2,000, so you don't want to go too high or just don't let the thing go forever if it's not learning, especially if you didn't pick the right learning rate. Um, then uh, you know we have stopping tolerance, which uh, this is an analog system. This you know this is an spitting out uh, you know, pretty high precision numbers between zero and one, and then uh, we're driving it towards asymptotes of zero and one. And so we see here now is um, one of the cases being uh, picked in the. So this is the input section where I'm defining essentially what case that I'm. Uh, Evaluating here, and this is case number two. If you look at the uh, the input, the ex inputs there, and the uh, desired output in MATLAB form, uh, MATLAB has vectors and matrices. So uh, this is a matrix with uh, vectors that you see there, <coughs> and uh, then you see below uh, reference to it to it learning. So now we see um, in a while loop here for as long as uh, all four exemplars, uh, all four of them have not yet reached within a stopping tolerance of the asymptotes of zero or one, that we've, decided that we've defined a stopping tolerance above, um, <clears throat> then you keep learning. And then uh, for i equals one to four, you see below there, that's for all four exemplars in this particular training set. We want to evaluate the outputs of uh, C, D, and E neurons, not A and B, because A and B are just splitters. And then we use this uh, 1 over 1 plus E to the sum of the weighted uh, weights times the inputs uh, for each of these neurons. <laughs> and that is the um, you know, a transcendental function, a sigmoid. This is a sigmoid. Uh, it needs to be continuously differentiable for traditional neural network learning that you can learn about in other courses with me. Now, in this case, we're going to take a look at using weights from a previous training and using them to speed up learning uh, in a new situation. So we're taking the weights learned from case number one, the first neural network training, where the inputs were purely binary. And we take those learned weights and we're going to use them in uh, case number three where we have fuzzy input, the same fuzzy input from case number two, where you can see that the learning took approximately uh, or a little bit over 500 epochs to learn. And now with these improved weights or weights from a, you know, a similar situation, it's the same kind of problem. It's just fuzzy inputs. And we see that the neural network learns uh, 225 epochs. Uh, so you see in the code below, uh, at the beginning at the top of the screen, where the initial weights are simply randomized. That's what you typically do in most cases. However, even though there are mathematical methods to optimize those. Um, and then as this particular example, we are overwriting those initial randomized weights with these weights from a previous uh, training. And now we can take a look at the actual learning going on here, where the uh, the change or the back propagation is going on, and it's going firstly through the uh, uh, the the J K weights, which are between the hidden layer and the output layer. So we're taking an error signal uh, f defined by the difference between what we're actually getting out of the uh, network as we're learning and what we desire you know for all for all these exemplars you know in at least mean squared uh, error uh, gradient descent way that you learn in other courses with me um, and so you can see in the slide here uh, that we're changing these weights and there's two sections this first part is in the JK uh, weights and then we back propagate now it's not completely clear of what, why it's the way it is in this uh, algorithm and, uh, and it's, you know, it's different than in the JK level unless you look a little further into the calculus of it all. 
and so um, and derive these equations, you know, why they actually look like they do. But essentially, you have to go through the neurons you know, to get to the uh, layer that's closest to the beginning of the network. You've got to propagate the error through the weights and the neurons uh, in the hidden layer, you know, in the weights between the, in the, you know, between the hidden and output layer and uh, through the neurons <coughs> in the hidden layer to then change the uh, neurons, I mean the weights, change the weights in the I, J layer between the input and uh, hidden layer. And um, <coughs> there's a link to see more about that uh, below if you like. Um, so this is a, a big neural network conference with 300 papers submitted and I got an award for comparing top down and bottom up and then by top down I mean mathematical models versus bottom up is more biological models and so I have uh, a couple chips uh, that I designed 1991 and 1992 and 3 <coughs> um, that you can see there it's also a, a draft book chapter Joseph Wonderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, computer science, and architecture. And uh, this is a lecture on uh, showing you some simple code that I developed in 2019 for uh, neural network processors that I was uh, developing in my master's thesis and uh, my initial PhD research before I went to IBM Supercomputer design and development uh, created these neural network processors graduate schools and this is a simple simulation from 30 years ago uh, showing you how a basic neural network works this is in the uh, advanced computer engineering course uh, engineering computer science 433 in spring of 2020 the MATLAB script and so uh, we'll, uh, let this video run and narrate it so you see this code here developed uh, for 221 that's two inputs two hidden layer neurons and one output or 331 and then some fixes that I did over time uh, just CPU time for reference relative different runs um, and then you can pick the architecture. So I'm picking the 221 here. Uh, the learning rate of one, which is, uh, explain that a little later. I don't want that too big or converged answers. Want it too small, it'll take forever. Uh, 4,000 epics, that's uh, 4,000. Uh, don't want to go any more than that. Um, uh, the presentation of the training set here you see below, stop intolerance of point one, explain that in a second. And this is a simple uh, OR gate that you see here in the 221. Uh, and so you only get uh, zero when you input two zeros, otherwise you get one, because either one of them or both of them input will output a one. So it's an input, input, and output in that array. And so I'm running it here. And um, this one should be pretty quick. You'll see uh, on the y-axis that um, 0.9 will be the cutoff for considering it a logic one. And then when it uh, scrolls itself up uh, in that lab, you'll see the y-axis on the lower end being 0.1 because the stopping tolerance I've set is at point one, so um, either a nine, uh, either a point nine, so one minus point one is point nine, or zero plus point one, point one, so the upper and lower limits, you consider as logic one and zero, that stopping tolerance, point nine. So you see the, uh, this one goes pretty quickly to a solution here where the only time it's zero is when both inputs are zero, that's the blue, and the green, yellow, and red 
are the other cases of uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So we see learning rate 1, college up and times 0.1, and 85 seconds. This is just the relative number. And then uh, down below here, you see initial weights were set. Those are the weights between the connections. You weight the connections between the neurons. I'll explain that a little later. And so you see uh, legend here. The blue is the zero zero input, the red zero one, yellow one zero. And the stopping tolerance is at uh, 0.9 and 0.1 for the ones and zeros. And uh, next, we want to make this something a little different. So uh, it seems like one minor change, but we'll find out this is a major difficulty for neural networks. Um, you know, an exclusive OR. So when you get one one input, we want a zero now instead of a one. And that is uh, harder for the thing to learn, the neural network to learn. Um, if uh, you have both inputs zero and that's zero, but then anytime you add either one and you get a one out, that an OR gate, that makes sense, or both. But when you have a one, one, and you get a zero, even though the zero ones and one zero gave a one, that's still more difficult for it to learn. That's called linear separability. We'll learn about that in other places. Now, this is going to take um, significantly longer to, uh, to learn. So you see it here just progressing along looks like nothing's happening they're all just kind of riding along the same place right? the initial weights uh, and the biases each neuron has actually an input from the side also and in future networks you can uh, have two different neural networks uh, influencing each other through the bias and then you can watch the numbers here uh, scrolling if you like for the four cases each of the exemplars in the training set. So you have inputs, um, stimulus, and desired outputs or actual outputs here that we're watching. Uh, the desired outputs are the behavior we're trying to make it learn. In this case, the exclusive or. And um, it's not. Uh, they're not separating uh, the the three the four cases are not separating uh, very easily here because uh, it's trying to compromise between these four different constraints each of the exemplars is um, a constraint it needs to learn how to do all four of them even if they contradict each other every all four of those uh, those combinations of desired inputs and are um, inputs with desired outputs, stimulus and desired output combinations, all four of them need to be satisfied simultaneously. So it's just kind of chugging along here. And um, we'll learn that um, the uh, value, the uh, optimization that we're looking for, the learning is equivalent to uh, a local minima on an error surface where the error is defined by a collective difference between all of the desired, all of the desired outputs and what you're actually getting in any uh, particular iteration. And so you generate this error surface. Now it's an n-dimensional space, uh, where n's a number of weights. So you know, we have more than that here. We have more than, it's not just four weights, we have, we have four uh, exemplars, but it's a two, two, one architecture with everything connected together. So uh, all those weights need to settle. If it was just a three-dimensional space of three weights, which you can't have, but for visualization, you could imagine an error surface where you're trying to find a, a, a minimum and uh, you do gradient descent uh, learning. Right, it's calc three, um, multivariable chain rule, perhaps calc two, that's who I talk to where that's learned. <laughs> but, um, and we can look at that in later, lessons. But for here, uh, now what we see is now they're starting to separate. So that's one reason the learning rate needs to be small. So that when you're traversing across the error surface, 
you want very small little steps so you can get down into a trench where the local minima is and get down in there. Otherwise, you can hop back and forth over if the running range is too big. So you see separation here, and you see the blue one finally um, going down. Now that is the zero, the blue one is the zero, zero case. And so that's going to go down, and that should output a zero. But now this green one, now the green one is the, uh, is the one one case and we want a zero for that but see it's not it's not working and so that um it needs to work on this a little bit and redistribute the changes in the weights so each time you present one of these exemplars in the set the training set uh, you take the error between what's actually coming out at any given moment which is not binary and what your desired output is and then you back propagate that uh, and change the weights and then you do the next exemplar try to change the weights again uh, and, and, and you do change the weights again and you hope for some kind of compromise eventually so the blue one's almost uh, you know the, uh, the zero zero case of the blue is almost where it needs to be but the green still needs to work on the green here so how long will it take now this learning rate you can make as a variable itself and there are uh, there is a technique called momentum i'm not introducing it in this simple example but momentum would be where it would learn from previous uh, epochs uh, if if there was a lot of change going on and if it didn't look like it it would uh, accelerate or you know, magnify the learning rate and then when it starts seeing things change and slow down i've also seen this that implemented um, manually with a joystick so you could watch this and you could you know, crank up the learning rate in that big plateau area where they're all kind of grouped together and not doing much and as soon as you start seeing change uh, pull back on the joystick don't let it change too much or you might just you know, it goes unstable and or, or it just Finds, uh, or I can't find the local minimum to, to solve the, uh, the problem. So now we see that green is bending down, which is good because the green needs to go down and the yellow and the red are the two cases for the exclusive or the two cases where you do one and one output. So those should be heading up towards the uh, one y-axis and the green should be coming down so you can watch those numbers if you like uh, you can see the first one there the output zero zero it needs, just needs to get to point one and then that will be satisfied now it will keep changing until all of them have changed because you're still changing weights all over the place so you can't just stop changing the weights for that particular one once you reach a threshold because the weights need to represent a compromise between all of them. So just satisfying one doesn't mean you know, stop doing anything with the error created from that one. You have to constantly present all of the training set over and over again and get the error for each one of those exemplars and back propagate them one at a time for all the exemplars. In this case, there's four. And that's one epoch, which what you see is what you see on the uh, X axis here are epochs. So we have 12, you know, we reach going towards 1200 epochs. That's 4,800 presentations of exemplars because there's you know, four times 1200. There's four exemplars in the training set. So we're almost there. Um, you can see in the numbers below that uh, uh, the first case is definitely below 0.1 already. Uh, the green one's still reaching down. It's not quite there yet, but the two middle cases are getting close to 0.9. At 0.89 on both of those, and all we need is 0.1 uh, to consider it. Um, I'm sorry, 0.9 to consider it a uh, one. And so, you know, the first three cases are satisfied, but we're not done learning until all the all the exemplars in the training set are satisfied. We're still changing the weights all over the place. Now, if you have a huge network with lots of interconnection weights, there'll be whole regions that settle down and so solve part of the problem, don't tweak too much, 
and other regions that will take over, uh, typically, if you have a big enough network. So we're just waiting now on the very last one here. You see the one one case, and that needs to get down uh, below 0.1 so we can consider a logic zero, right? So that's what we're heading for. We're trying to get less than 0.1 on the first and last case to consider it a logic zero. That's how we've defined it with our stopping tolerance. And then the two middle cases above 0.9, greater than 0.9, to be considered a logic one. So we're trying to do a binary function. We're learning a binary function, but these neural networks are not. They're analog uh, calculations. So uh, we want to look at this graph here. Just get this brought forward. And so you can see this took uh, quite a bit more time. You know, it's going to be on the order of, of magnitude of, you know, 10 times more uh, to learn uh, the exclusive OR gate than the OR gate in this, in this type of architecture. And this is so CPO time, but that's the actual time is irrelevant. Just think of the relative difference between the different uh, things that you're learning. Because uh, this varies by machine. I've ran this uh, VPNing to an office machine. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> and so this... It varies, but the relative uh, magnitudes are what you look at. So that is our example of uh, our simple example in this uh, software introduction to uh, uh, neural network learning. Joseph Wonderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, computer science, and architecture. And uh, this is a lecture on uh, showing you some simple code that I developed in 2019 for uh, neural network processors that I was uh, developing in my master's thesis and uh, my initial PhD research before I went to IBM Supercomputer design and development, uh, created these neural network processors, graduate schools. And this is a simple simulation from 30 years ago, uh, showing you how a basic neural network works. This is in the advanced computer engineering course, uh, engineering computer science 433, spring of 2020. The MATLAB script. And so I'll uh, we'll, uh, let this video run and narrate it. So you see this code here developed uh, for 221. That's two inputs, two hidden layer neurons, and one output, or 331. And then some fixes that I did over time, uh, just CPU time for reference relative different runs. Um, and then you can pick the architecture. So I'm picking the 221 here. Uh, the learning rate of one, which is, uh, I'll explain that later. I don't want that too big or converged answers. I don't want it too small, it'll take forever. Uh, 4,000 epics, that's uh, 4,000. Uh, don't want to go any more than that. Uh, uh, the presentation of the training set here you see below, stopping tolerance of point one, explain that in a second. And this is a simple uh, OR gate that you see here in the 221. Uh, and so you only get uh, zero when you input two zeros, otherwise you get one, because either one of them or both of them input will output a one. So it's an input, input, and output in that array. And so I'm running it here. And um, this one should be pretty quick. You'll see uh, on the y-axis that um, 0.9 will be the cutoff for considering it a logic one. And then when it uh, scrolls itself up, uh, MATLAB 
you'll see the y-axis on the lower end being 0.1 because the stopping tolerance I've set is at 0.1, so um, either a nine, uh, either a 0.9, so one minus 0.1 is 0.9 or zero plus 0.1, so the upper and lower limits you consider as logic one and zero. That stopping tolerance, 0.9, so you see the, uh, this one goes pretty quickly to a solution here where the only time it's zero is when both inputs are zero. That's the blue and the green, yellow, and red are the other cases of zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So we see learning rate one, tolerance seven times point one, and 85 seconds. This is just a relative number. And then uh, down below here, you see initial weights were set. Those are the weights between the connections. You weight the connections between the neurons. I'll explain that a little later. And so you see uh, in the legend here, uh, the blue is the zero, zero input, the red, zero, one, yellow, one, zero. And the stopping tolerance is at uh, 0 0.9 and 0.1. Zeros. And uh, next, we want to make this something a little different. So uh, it seems like one minor change, but we'll find out this is a major difficulty for neural networks. Um, you know, an exclusive OR. So when you get one one input, we want a zero now instead of a one. And that is uh, harder for the thing to learn, the neural network to learn. Um, if uh, you have both inputs zero and that's zero, but then anytime you add either one and you get a one out, that in the OR gate, that makes sense or both. But when you have a one one and you get a zero, even though the zero ones and one zero gave a one, that's still more difficult for it to learn. That's called linear separability. Learn about that in other places. Now this is gonna take um, significantly longer to uh, to learn so you see it here just progressing along looks like nothing's happening they're all just kind of riding along the same place right? the initial weights uh, and the biases each neuron has actually an input from the side also and in future networks you can uh, have two different neural networks uh, influencing each other through the bias. And then you can watch the numbers here, uh, scrolling if you like, for the four cases, each of the exemplars in the training set. So you have inputs, um, stimulus, and desired outputs or actual outputs here that we're watching. Uh, the desired outputs are the behavior we're trying to make it learn, in this case, the exclusive or. And um, it's not, uh, they're not separating. Uh, the, the three, the four cases are not separating uh, very easily here because uh, it's trying to compromise between these four different constraints. Each of the exemplars is, um, constraint. It needs to learn how to do all four of them, even if they contradict each other. Every, all four of those, uh, those combinations of desired inputs and or, um, inputs with desired outputs, the stimulus and desired output combinations, all four of them need to be satisfied simultaneously. So it's just kind of chugging along here. And um, we'll learn that um, the uh, value, the uh, optimization that we're looking for, the learning is equivalent to um, a local minima on an error surface where the error is defined by uh, the collective difference between all of the desired, all of the desired outputs and what you're actually getting in any uh, particular iteration. And so you generate this error surface. Now it's an n-dimensional space uh, where ends a number of weights. So you know, we have more than that here. We have more than, it's not just four ways, we have, we have four uh, exemplars, but it's a two, two, one architecture with everything connected together. 
So uh, all those weights need to settle. If it was just a three-dimensional space of three weights, which you can't have, but for visualization, you could imagine an error surface where you're trying to find a, a, a minimum and uh, you do gradient descent uh, learning. Right, it's calc three, um, multivariable chain rule, perhaps calc two, that's who I talked to where that's learned. <laughs> but, um, and we can look at that in later lessons. But for here, uh, now what we see is now they're starting to separate. So that's one reason the learning rate needs to be small so that when you're traversing across the error surface, you want very small little steps so you can get down into a trench where the local minima is and get down in there. Otherwise, you can hop back and forth over if the learning rate is too big. So you see separation here, and you see the blue one finally um, going down. Now that is the zero, the blue one is the zero, zero case. And so that's going to go down, and that should output a zero. But now this green one, now the green one is the... Uh, is the one one case and we want a zero for that but see it's not it's not working and so that um, it needs to work on this a little bit and redistribute the changes in the weights so each time you present one of these exemplars in the set the training set uh, you take the error between what's actually coming out at any given moment which is not binary and what your desired output is and then you back propagate that uh, and change the weights and then you do the next exemplar and try to change the weights again uh, and, you, and, and you do change the weights again and you hope for some kind of compromise eventually so the blue one's almost uh, you know the, uh, the zero zero case the blue is almost where it needs to be but the green still needs to work on the green here so how long will it take now this learning rate you can make as a variable itself and there are uh, there is a technique called momentum i'm not introducing it in this simple example but momentum would be where it would learn from previous uh, epochs uh, if if there was a lot of change going on and if it didn't look like it it would uh, accelerate or you know, magnify the learning rate and then when it starts seeing things change and slow down I've also seen this that implemented um, manually with a joystick so you could watch this and you could you know, crank up the learning rate in that big plateau area where they're all kind of grouped together and not doing much and as soon as you start seeing change uh, pull back on the joystick don't let it change too much or you might just you know, it goes unstable and or, or it just finds, uh, or I can't find the local minimum to, to solve the, uh, the problem. So now we see the green is bending down, which is good because the green needs to go down and the yellow and the red are the two cases for the exclusive or the two cases where you do one and one output. So those should be heading up towards the uh, one y-axis and the green should be coming down so you can watch those numbers if you like uh, you can see the first one there the output zero zero it, it just needs to get to point one and then that will be satisfied now it will keep changing until all of them have changed because you're still changing weights all over the place so you can't just stop changing the weights for that particular one once you reach the threshold because the weights need to represent a compromise between all of them so just satisfying one doesn't mean uh, you know, stop doing anything with the error created from that one you have to constantly present all of the training set over and over again and get the error for each one of those exemplars and back propagate them one at a time uh, for all the exemplars in this case there's four and that's one epoch which what you see is what you see on the uh, X axis here are epochs. So we have 12, you know, we reach going towards 1200 epochs. That's 4,800 presentations of exemplars because there's you know, four times 1200. There's four exemplars in the training set. So we're almost there. Um, you can see in the numbers below that uh, uh, the first case is definitely below 0.1 already. Uh, the green one's still reaching down. It's not quite 
there yet, but the two middle cases are getting close to 0 0.9, at 0.89 on both of those, and all we need is 0 0.1 uh, to consider it, um, I'm sorry, 0 0.9 to consider it a uh, one, and so, you know, the first three cases are satisfied, but we're not done learning until all the, tr all the exemplars in the training set are satisfied. We're still changing the weights all over the place. Now, if you have a huge network with lots of interconnection weights, there'll be whole regions that settle down and so solve part of the problem, don't tweak too much, and other regions that'll take over, uh, typically, if you have a big enough network. So we're just waiting now on the very last one here, you see, one one case and that needs to get down um, below point one so we can consider a logic zero right so that's what we're heading for we're trying to get less than point one on the first and last case to consider it a logic zero that's how we've defined it with our stopping tolerance and then the two middle cases above point nine greater than point nine be considered a logic one. So we're trying to do a binary function. We're learning a binary function, but these neural networks are not. They're analog uh, calculations. So uh, we want to look at this graph here. Just get this brought forward. And so you can see this took, uh, Quite a bit more time, you know. It's going to be on the order of, of magnitude of you know ten times more uh, to learn uh, the exclusive OR gate than the OR gate in this in this type of architecture. And this is so CPO time, but that's the actual time is irrelevant. Just think of the relative difference between the different uh, things that you're learning, uh, because this varies by machine. I've ran this uh, VPNing to a office machine, you know. And, and so this, it varies, but the relative uh, magnitudes are what you look at. So that is our example of uh, our simple example in this uh, software introduction to uh, uh, neural network learning. Um. Yeah, just for a sec, let's go in here and look at that. So uh, the neural network learning very quickly, uh, just to show you what the math looks like, and you can take time to look at that later if you like. My name is Professor Joseph Wunderlich. I teach computer engineering and also architecture, uh, building architecture as well as computer architecture. This uh, lecture is a very quick uh, fly through, flyover of this um, uh, paper, book chapter, uh, a mix of research I've done in the past, a paper and one in the award on uh, that uh, is covered in detail in machine intelligence class through lectures that we won't do here. So uh, the idea is a top down versus bottom up um, neuro And by that you see in these two diagrams here, what you see is a biological neuron versus a mathematical or a psychological kind of uh, control system model. And that's, that's what the meaning of uh, bottom up would be from the biology perspective, uh, top down would be from the uh, mathematical or control theory perspective. Then the analog or the, the model of the output transient voltage of a biological neuron is, uh, can be modeled like this. So uh, this RC network of resistors and capacitors. Uh, I built a chip like this. Um, and then the top down, you'll see a different models that are compared here. You have to go back in the history and look at back propagation, Madeline, Hopfield, Bolton machine, and BAM, and neocognitron. 
So those those were picked, and then uh, uh, you'll see some of the rationale for the uh, how to do the uh, the digital or analog of that circuitry based on the learning or the uh, neuron transfer function. Uh, you see a comparison here. The the bottom up is uh, an analog circuit of uh, resistors and capacitors and some switching. And then below is this mathematical model, or this uh, typical neural network model that you see for backpropagation. Um, then uh, the continuing for the backpropagation is uh, uh, talking about the, the functions, the transfer functions, and the and, uh, weight changing functions and how those are uh, put into algorithms. Then there is some sample code here for doing that. And uh, more sample code. More simple sample code. A little more. Then you start seeing these uh, numerical methods I use to approximate uh, curve fitting the uh, uh, continuously differential transfer function using polynomials uh, with the hope of going fully parallel with polynomials and all digital on a chip. And you see the error below here, analyzing the error in the bottom graph. And various different mathematical numerical methods, and each of and the error associated with each of them, and there's a plus and minus associated with each, so you have to look through that. Uh, just different different models and different error, and then uh, I got it nailed down to one that I picked, and then there's always saying with these numerical methods and these polynomial uh, approximations, uh, they're only good for a certain range. So I asked myself the question. Could I clip it off at certain points, like just the, you know, it's getting up near the asymptotes at one and zero, uh, you know, these sigmoids, and so can I just clip it off where it starts losing the polynomial approximation just is not accurate anymore? So then I, I coined this thing called the clip sigmoid. Uh, I played with that and showed that that can still learn. Then you see some code with the clip sigmoid. And uh, you're clipping at different points, and also the different numerical methods. So you see in the summary in the beginning, the clipping uh, at different parts of the range, and also the numerical method used for approximating a polynomial. And there's code for that. More code for that. Still more code, but difference, different polynomial approximation methods. Still more, more code. And then we look at uh, gradient descent learning analysis of what's, uh, you know, what am I tweaking here? I'm, you know, I want to get look at the learning. Uh, so look at the mathematics and the calculus. So there's a derivation of that. And you can see them uh, minimizing uh, the, the sum squared error here is the idea. Of, of the differences between the desired outputs and the actual outputs. That's the error that I want to minimize and I want to change the weights with respect to that. So you see the partial derivatives and the calculus involved in that. And then you see the, uh, the breakdown of the calculus using the quotient rule and different parts of, uh, of the calculus involved. Uh, and then the graphs below here, you're looking at the, the fact that you're taking, you're using the derivative, you're changing weights uh, based on the derivative, the slope of the curve of the transfer function, which is maximum uh, right at x equals zero. So you see in the, on the right-hand graph there that uh, the, the, the rate of change uh, has to, is maximum right at the middle. That tells you that the neuron is, is is deciding which way to go, and it's, and you're magnifying that, this gradient descent, and that helps with the learning, is magnifying the decision process in the, uh, in the middle range there. So this above calculations here is the backpropagation of the error from the output neuron to the hidden layer. 
Now we have to extend that with the multivariable chain rule, uh, taking the backpropagating the error signal through those weights into the, you know, into the hidden layer and then into the, between the hidden layer and the input layer. We're changing the weights between the hidden layer and the input layer now. And so you see uh, the same kind of thing going on. The calculation is a little more complicated because you're carrying through the whole uh, uh, weight change from the, from the end to the beginning. Network. Then you see here uh, a chip that I built um, for the bottom up approach. And then um, the top down was uh, uh, looking at and, and it was a mathematical analysis and a paper design and, uh, of, a, of a neural network chip and also the, uh, the analysis for doing the clip sigmoid. And so that was part of the patent disclosure document I did in 1992 for the, for the, for the uh, top down method. Uh, compared to what you see with the, the chip design there for the uh, bottom-up uh, method. And just a couple more references. So you certainly want to go back and look at this in depth, uh, and there would be other lectures more. This is more of a, an overview lecture. Okay, um, I'm going to stop recording there. This is just an overview. There's, of course, a lot more depth, a lot more breadth, all kinds of examples, all kinds of tools you can use now. Uh, but this is an intro. <clears throat>